This is the Advanced Brain Podcast with third-generation neurotechnology pioneer, entrepreneur, best-selling author, music producer, keynote and TEDx speaker, Alex Doman. Improve your mental wellness as Alex sits down with the leading thought leaders of our time about how to optimize your brain, body, and life with the latest and most powerful tools to help you reach your unlimited potential. This episode was previously recorded and released as part of the Sound Brain Fitness Series and is being re-released here in the Advanced Brain Podcast. Now, listen in and discover how to become the best version of yourself with Alex Doman. Good evening. I'm your host, Alex Doman, calling in from Advanced Brain Technologies in Ogden, Utah. So tonight's topic is brainstorm, the power and purpose of the teenage brain. In the New York Times bestseller Brainstorm, Dr. Daniel Siegel illuminates how brain development impacts adolescent behavior and relationships from ages 12 to 24. Drawing on important new research in the field of interpersonal neurobiology, he explores exciting ways in which understanding how the teenage brain functions can help parents make what is in fact an incredibly positive period of growth, change, and experimentation in their child's lives less lonely and distressing on both sides of the generational divide. Tonight's program is going to help you identify changes in the teenage brain responsible for increased risk-taking, outline how to integrate in the brain during adolescence promotes just thinking, and name four essential aspects of adolescence and describe an integrated relationship. Now, please let me tell you a little bit about my guest. Uh, Dr. Daniel Siegel, MD, is a graduate of Harvard Medical School and completed his postgraduate medical education at UCLA with training in pediatrics and child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry. He is currently a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine, founding co-director of of UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center, co-investigator at the Center for Culture, Brain, and Development, and executive director of the Mindsight Institute, an educational center devoted to promoting insight, compassion, and empathy in individuals, families, institutions, and communities. Dr. Siegel's psychotherapy practice over the last 25 years has included children, adolescents, adults, couples, and families. Dr. Dr. Siegel Siegel is an author who has published extensively for the professional audience. He serves as the founding editor for the Norton Professional Series on Interpersonal Neurobiology, which contains over three dozen textbooks. Dr. Siegel's books include Mindsight, Pocket Guide to Interpersonal Neurobiology, The Developing Mind, Second Edition, The Mindful Therapist, The Mindful Brain, Parenting from the Inside Out, The New York Times bestsellers, The Whole Brain Child, Brainstorm, and his latest, No Drama Discipline. He has been invited to lecture for the King of Thailand, Pope John Paul II, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Google University, and TEDx. Welcome, Daniel. Hey, thank you for having me, Alex. I appreciate being here. Oh, I'm so pleased to have you this evening. Um, I uh, spent the Thanksgiving holiday reading Brainstorm, you know, and I'm a, a parent to three boys, two of whom happen to be adolescents, age 14 and 18. So I really read the book with great personal as well as professional interest. And I know you two are a parent, and you have two uh, 20-somethings in your lives. Could you tell me um, what compelled you to write Brainstorm? You know, a couple of things compelled me. One was uh, the fact that, as you mentioned, I have two kids who are now actually in their 20s, and I wanted to really understand what had happened during this period of time, which for a lot of it was confusing. Um, The other is I'm a professional as a therapist, so I work as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I was just puzzled by how what we were taught in our training didn't seem to jive with what I was experiencing personally and also with a lot of my clients, my patients. And the third thing, I guess, is that, you know, I write books for parents and try to synthesize science for therapists. So I wanted to just take a look at what is the new science of adolescence and is there something new we can learn about it? So for all those reasons, I looked into writing a book and then ultimately I decided that the book should be for adolescents themselves to read as well as their parents and therapists. 
so that the book actually is a book for teenagers and older adolescents to actually read. Yeah, I, I, I appreciated that as a parent, that this was actually a text that I can hand over to our boys and exactly. have them, you know, get some get some insight to themselves. And and I and I wanna go back because, you know, in your in your training as a physician, um, what did you find were the shortcomings in that medical training that left you ill prepared to deal with the team brain? Well, you know, there's all these statements we hear, um, not just as professionals, but as parents from our pediatricians or from teachers or just going to dinner with a bunch of other parents where they'll say things like, oh, the adolescent period is such a horrible period of time or, oh, my gosh, you have a 10-year-old, just wait, or, you know, your teen is crazy. There are even books by that name. Uh, And there's an attitude that it's um, a period... Uh, here's another myth that, uh, of raging hormones that are going to drive your adolescent mad, and it's a period of just massive immaturity that they just have to get over as quickly as they can. And all those statements, each one of them, is misleading. It's not really fair to what's actually going on. And in some cases, those statements are you know, disempowering, if not just outright insulting. And so they, they make it so if you're a parent of a preteen or of an adolescent, it just confuses you. And if you're an adolescent yourself, there's nothing in any of those statements. First of all, they're not true, but there's nothing in those statements that's helpful to you. So uh, all of those things made me really feel like, let's try to have something that that uh, clarifies what the truth is and you know debunks these myths that are out very commonly, not just in our culture, but throughout the world. So what I hear you saying is that teenagers have really gotten a bad rap. They really have. You know, it's it's sad because there's a lot of negative belief out there that, as we know, you know, when you're living as a social being as we are and you pick up people's beliefs in you, that is, if people believe you don't have much potential, well, you'll soak that in and think you don't have much potential. And if people think you're nuts, well, you'll soak that in and think your behavior is kind of nutty. When instead, there are all sorts of things that when you realize what the truths are, you can do something to actually take the challenging parts, because there's no question, adolescence is a challenging period of life, but you can actually turn a challenge into a triumph. So on on that note, what would you say are really the primary benefits and challenges of the adolescent period? Well, there's a number of things that I remember with uh, an acronym that's uh, it, it said, uh, people say I have a, an acronym addiction. You know, a lot of my books oh, that, have a lot that, of these that's, acronyms. That's, that's clear, and uh, <laughs> I, I relate to that quite well. Okay, well, then, then we, we, you and I are probably not the ones to share this acronym with everybody, but I appreciate about half the people hate acronyms and half love them. So my apologies to those in the former group. But, you know, acronyms are just a a way to remember um, kind of the core aspects of something with a word that hopefully has some relationship to the thing you're talking about. And in this case, the the question is, what's the essence of adolescence? And what you're asking me, Alex, is like, what are the the essence of adolescent brain changes, for example? So luckily, the essence of adolescent brain changes can be arranged in such a fashion and named in such a way that it spells the word essence. So we can go over the four components of essence, which really are the big challenges and big changes that happen in the adolescent brain. So what are they? The first is ES, emotional spark. So all the studies of the brain of an adolescent across the lifespan, that is looking at a child, then studying an adolescent, and then seeing how adults are. So you do this cross lifespan comparison, the adolescent brain is more emotional. So all the input from the body and the lower areas of the brain, which create our emotions, push forward up to the higher part of the brain, the cortex, where we reason and think. So you have this flood of emotions that's more intense, more robust, it's more um, influential in how you manage your day-to-day life. And the reason for that, uh, you know, because you say, why would nature do that? One thing to think about about adolescence, this period between childhood dependency and 
adult responsibility is nature is getting this individual ready to leave the familiar, comfortable, safe, and certain home nest. Now, not every child has safety in their home, it's true, but the majority do. And as you get ready to leave, you got to have something to activate motion. And one way of actually describing what an emotion is, is it evokes motion. And so that's one reason we can think that nature has created a more emotional brain. It gets this individual ready to take some action in the world. Now, the downside of that is, as we know, you know, adolescents can be irritable. They can have moods that are very labile, that is, they come and go. They can have emotions that flood them and confuse them. They can be um, overwhelmed with their emotions, so they don't feel very good. They can feel kind of out of sorts. And, you know, it, this is a period where emotional distress is can be prevalent, but even there's a higher risk for mood disorders, which um, may be related to other aspects of the adolescent brain changes. So it's no question, emotionally, it is a more um, intense period that is challenging. And what we want to do to optimize those challenges is teach adolescents and the adults who care for them, you know, that these emotions are part and parcel of what the adolescent brain remodeling is all about. And instead of thinking that the adolescent is nuts, we have to realize that they're being filled with passion and how you really cultivate a positive relationship to your own passion if you're the adolescent or, you know, if you're an adult supporting them, help the adolescent learn to live well is kind of like surfing. You know, you you don't want to avoid the waves and you don't want to get just swallowed up by the waves. You want to learn how to surf. And so that's what we want to do with the adolescent period is teach adolescents how to surf the waves of their emotion, which is part of these mindset skills I teach in the Brainstorm book. And I guess a big part of that is helping helping them to become more resilient beings, because I, I see low resilience as being a, a very common trait in the teens that I've known. Exactly. And resilience, you know, can be thought of as how you allow your emotions to be robust in your life, but not flood you so that, especially in the face of a stressor, you come back to equilibrium pretty readily. And, um, and this is exactly the source of, of resilience, is knowing your own emotions. It's, some people like the word, you know, emotional literacy or emotional skills or emotional intelligence. These are really all terms trying to describe that resilience you're talking about. And absolutely, emotions are a big part of that. Certainly. And, you know, you you talk about in, in your writings uh, quite a bit about the low road. And, you know, isn't it true that it's really this low low road, our, our more primitive brain, our more foundational brain levels that are in large part regulating what's happening with our with our emotional spark. Yeah. So the emotional spark, uh, this is, you know, it's a big area. Interestingly, in science, there's not really a complete agreement about what emotions are. But one view of the many views in science is that the body, so your muscles and your bones, your endocrine system, your hormones, uh, the way your heart is pumping, um, uh, all the different systems of your body uh, are going to push upward and send signals to lower parts of the brain, the brain stem and the limbic area. And these are all below the cortex, so we can call these subcortical inputs. Um, these subcortical regions create emotion. That's one view. And in that view, then, those emotions that are created from your body, your brain stem, your limbic area, they push upward shaping how you evaluate things and, and literally can push upward to the cortex and shape, of course, how you even perceive things. So we know as human beings that your emotional state directly alters not just how you think, but even the way you see something, the way you hear something, how you interpret your perceptual inputs. So emotions are a big deal. They shape everything. So when we say that you're talking about the low road, when you're only being bombarded by intense you know, subcortical input, it can be very confusing if it's not regulated well so that you say, okay, well, I was angry, so I thought you were saying to me, um, no pizza meant I would never have pizza again in my life, but you just meant we're going to go for Chinese food tonight. <laughs> you know, something like that. Well, that, so, well, that goes to that kind of hyper-literal 
outright response that we see in a lot of kids that they will will take some statements so absolutely literally in the moment. Well, you know, it's how true. How we arrive there? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. When this helped me with my kids. Um, there's a study that you know shows a neutral emotional expression, but an adult would interpret as neutral in a photograph, and a younger kid says that's a neutral face. Uh, an adult says it's a neutral face, but a, a, an adolescent will tend to see it as an angry face. So there's a, there, there are some particular predispositions to just feeling cautious, feeling vigilant. And that actually gets to the second part of essence, which is social engagement. You know, we are uh, moving as adolescents toward a time of, of separating from our parents and being out in the world. And in nature, it's not just humans that have adolescence, but in nature, other mammalian species, if you go out of the home nest as a, an adolescent mammal, if you don't have other adolescents you're hanging with, you're lunch. You're going to be eaten. So there's literally safety in numbers. So from an evolutionary point of view, what nature has done is made the adolescent uh, turn on SE, social engagement. So ES is emotional spark. The second component of the essence is social engagement. And, you know, what that means is that there's deep brainstem structures and also limbic area structures as well, like the amygdala, for example, that work together to say, hey, I better be connected with other adolescents um, or I'm going to be dead. So it's a life and death feeling. So when your kid comes to you and says, as a 15-year-old, I got to buy this shoe, you know, if I don't have this shoe, uh, something terrible is going to happen. As parents, we need to really accept that the feeling of life and death is not the weakness of our child. It's actually the evolutionary history that if every ancestor of that adolescent of yours didn't feel that way and just went out in the world by themselves, that kid of yours wouldn't be there. So it's this kind of drive to belong. Now, that's the reason for it, it's survival. But the downside of it is for some adolescents, you can give up morality in order to gain membership. You know, and commonly we call that peer pressure. And, and so what you want to do as a, as a parent supporting an adolescent is say, I get it. You know, you need to go to this party is the feeling you have. You need to have that shoe. It's the feeling you have. You know, the shoe is too expensive. We're not, we don't pay that kind of money for a shoe. The party I'm concerned about because there's going to be drinking, no adults there. Whatever you decide is one thing, but you start with being present with your adolescent, respecting whatever feeling they're having, but not doing whatever they're requesting be done. So, you know, being present for your adolescent doesn't mean you're a pushover. It means you're really understanding what's going on in the mind of your adolescent. And the upside of social engagement, you know, and one thing we can try to support, and when I teach in middle schools and high schools, the, the adolescents directly is what I say. I said, you as an adolescent need to know that you may really want to belong to a group, but you can't let go of what I call an inner compass of morality that tells you what your values are in order just to gain membership. So you need to understand you may have a feeling of needing to belong, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to go sacrifice what's important to you in a deep, deep way. And they get it. And rather than just saying they're weak, you can understand these deep evolutionary forces at play. And the, the upside of social engagement is that every research study done on the important things like how long you live, how happy you can be, um, how mentally healthy you are, and how medically healthy you are point to social relationships that are supportive. So kids, as children, get their play dates and everything set up by their adults in their lives who care for them. But an adolescent is starting to negotiate the social world on their own. So these skills, these social skills they develop with social engagement are going to last a lifetime. And in fact, studies suggest you know, what you do in your adolescence actually has long-term effects for your adult life. So social engagement is a great thing. We need to support adolescents finding a positive way of using that drive they have. So what do, you know, what do we do with these socially isolated teens? Uh, the, the team that has very few uh, peer relationships, they don't feel like uh, they belong and, you know, what tends to go along with that is a heightened risk for depression. Totally. Um, well, what do we do to help these kids? 
you know, there's a couple of things. You want to understand, you know, why is a child depressed? Why are they isolated? What exactly going on? And sometimes there, there can be a depression that really needs focused treatment, you know, so, so and, you know, psychotherapy or other forms of intervention. So we, we don't want to just say, oh, isolation is just a choice of the, of the individual. It, it, can, it can be a sign of something very serious going on. And as we know, you know, suicide is a, um, a higher risk during adolescence, and sadly it seems to be going up, as, such as uh, is also true of the onset of different psychiatric conditions like depression or manic depressive illness, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. Um, you know, the, the period between 12 and 24, the second dozen years of life that you can roughly define as the adolescent period, is in fact the time you're most likely, if you're ever going to develop a, a major psychiatric disorder, including addiction, it's most likely to have its onset during this period. So we really want to watch for that. Um, and sadly, you know, when the isolation continues, a lot of negative things can happen, whether it's hurting oneself or hurting others. Um, that's a, a serious concern. So our, the way I think about it is, you know, our minds are not just embodied, they're fully you know, relational. And so if you see someone who's isolated, you know, and that, that means like totally isolated, like myself, I didn't really have a large group of friends. I had a couple of individual friends. So I always felt like I belonged within a friendship, a dyad, a pair. And I had a few pairs that were really important to me. So someone might have looked at me and said, why isn't he a member of you know, the Glee Club? Or you know, why isn't he like a part of this group? And I just wasn't a group kind of guy. So we're really talking about membership in a relationship that can be one-on-one. You know, and, and not just where you're isolating yourself with someone else planning bad things, but you know, where you find real close uh, connections with another person. So isolation is not, is not a healthy thing for, for anybody at any age. And we want to be supportive when it's there to say, look, you know, uh, can you not find a friend? What's going on? And, and really explore with the person what's, what's happening. Well, you know, and, and on the flip side, and maybe not so much the flip side, but, you know, I, I think about the neuron, the mirror neuron system. And I consider, and we look at teens, that parents may perceive that their kids are hanging out with a bad crowd and they're not mm-hmm. choosing the quote unquote good kids. So, you know, the the fear is that, you know, my child's going to begin mirroring the behaviors uh of of these others. What what advice do you do you give parents and are the mirror neurons kind of involved in that emulation of Well, that, that's a very interesting behavior? question. Uh I don't think anyone's ever studied uh mirror neurons specifically in adolescents like that. Uh, but the mirror neuron story is an important one to, to think about. So, you know, mirror neurons help you do a couple of things. They help you uh, sense another person's intentions, and that's really good for social relationships. They help you imitate their behavior, uh, other people's behavior, as you're pointing out. And they also help you uh, simulate their internal state, which is the base of empathy, meaning I'm going to feel as you feel. So all those things are great things. If Uh, A child uh, growing into adolescence doesn't have the opportunity to develop what you can call an internal compass, some guide to knowing who you are, even in the face of a drive for membership, Uh, then what's going to happen is they're going to be at risk for um, not knowing who they are. So in the Brainstorm book, what I do is I give literally exercises to develop self-awareness. So you can learn how to have this internal guide. It literally draws on your heart response, your intestines response, literally a gut feeling and a heartfelt sense. So that even though the brain is remodeling, the input from your body gives you a deep source of wisdom that can serve as an internal guide. And what we do in the book is do these mindset skill developing sections where they develop that. So I think schools should start having those reflective trainings Schools should not just be focusing on the outside world, but the inside world, because that's, you know, the answer to your question is how, if we have these mirror neurons, how do we keep from getting confused about another charismatic figure's ideas and they're the popular person and how can I be with them? Well, you want to develop an internal compass so that you can actually name what that is so you can tame it. Uh, And people can have, you know, people use the word self-possessed self-contained, self-assured, 
you know, that that's what we want to help develop kids so they know who they are and they're respectfully connecting to other people, but they know when not to imitate another person's action. Right. And and you know, I I guess we're we're going to the the next uh, letter, singular letter in your your acronym of essence of novelty. What what's important about novelty? Well, novelty is so interesting. You know, the raging hormone story is so commonly believed and hormones do rise but they're not raging. And if they were raging, first of all, I don't know what they would look like, but you'd have to give them anger management problems or something. So the only thing you could do if you're an adolescent who says, oh my God, my hormones are raging is like get a blood phoresis where you cleaning out your hormones and gave them a little training. And so the good news is that's not the story. It's not about raging hormones. So the disempowerment of that falsehood can be let go when instead there are two fundamental things that go on for novelty. So let's say, why does nature uh, need novelty seeking to be what adolescents generally do? Not all adolescents, but most adolescents do. Why do they need something new? Well, the reason is the home is familiar. It's comfortable. And if you're going to get that kid out of the house, so when they're 50, they're not still living there, you got to have something change in the brain to get them to be driven to get away from what's comfortable, familiar, safe, and certain. Now, the way you do that is with two fundamental changes. One is in the reward system of the brain, which is a circuit that goes between the deep brainstem, the middle limbic area, and the higher cortex. And it relies on a neurotransmitter called dopamine. So that when you do something rewarding, dopamine is squirted out, it's secreted, if you will. And when dopamine is secreted, you go, ah, that was good. One of the main things that secretes dopamine is novelty. So what nature does to get this adolescent even more driven for novelty than the regular person, kid or adult, but during the adolescent period, drops the baseline level of dopamine, basically, and raises the release levels. Now, what that means, if I'm that adolescent, is I feel a little bored and ootsy as as just sitting around because my baseline level is so low. And so I want to do something. And then when I finally do something that's new, bam, I get this big release. And I go, that felt really good. And so by dropping the baseline levels and increasing release levels, I basically set up this condition whereby I am going to be driven much more toward novelty. So that's a really good thing. That's a really good thing. Now, what's the downside of it? The downside is risky behavior is embedded within this change. So I'm looking for something that's not certain. I'm looking for something that's not comfortable. I'm looking for something that's not familiar. And I'm actually looking for something that's thrilling and potentially unsafe. So in that setup, then, what I'm doing is I'm at risk now, in fact, three times as likely to get hurt, either with a permanent injury or, a, or death from a dangerous thing that I'm doing. And this is in spite of the fact that my body during the adolescent period is stronger than at any other time. So if that wasn't enough, nature not only changes dopamine processing in the reward circuit, it changes the evaluation of things through the limbic area and cortex. And the evaluative circuits basically go like this. They say, what's important? What should I pay attention to? What should I care about? And it creates something that scientists call hyper-rational thinking. And what that means is you basically rationalize why, okay, I have a new car. It's really exciting to go 100 miles an hour. All my friends will think I'm the bomb because I drove 100 miles an hour. That's going to be great. You know, driving 100 miles an hour is probably dangerous. Someone could get hurt. I could get killed. Ah, but who cares about that? I'm going to drive 100 miles an hour. So hyper-rational thinking rationalizes the exciting part of a choice. So when scientists looked to see, number one, are adolescents not informed about danger? They found out, in fact, they are informed. In fact, many times they overestimate the chance of something bad happening. Overestimate. They just don't care about it. And the second thing is they ask, well, do adolescents have what is another myth, this feeling like they're immune to danger, like they're immortal? Well, actually, the feeling of immortality, denying your vulnerability, is equally present in adults and adolescents. It isn't an adolescent thing. It's a human thing. Uh, So 
it's this hyper-rational thinking combined with the dopamine change that drives you to novelty. The downside is risk. What's the upside? The upside is courage emerges from this. You say, I'm going out in the world, and I'm going to experience this world, the new things that are out there. And that's a great thing. That source of courage is something we need to encourage. Well, there's the word, encourage. <laughs> courage, you know, so that you can uh, actually uh, allow yourself to try on new things. What we want to do is teach adolescents to minimize the downside by giving them this internal compass so they can know, for example, when they get in that car, oh, yeah, my hyper-rational cortex and limbic area is saying, do this. But, you know, my heart and my gut, wow, this doesn't really feel right. I think I'm not going to drive the car. I don't even know why. It just feels wrong. Because the heart and the gut are not prone to the same kind of laws of the dopamine system and the hyper-rational thinking, and we want to really cultivate that internal compass for an adolescent. So, you know, that, that internal compass is a, an idea you keep coming back to, and I, you know, I think as we're raising our children when they're young, what are some strategies that parents can take to help guide that internal compass so that our, our kids go toward the better decisions, you know, for theirs and others' safety? Yeah, well, great question. Uh, the way to think about it is simply this. The internal compass is built upon a circuit that involves interoception. Now, interoception is a scientific word that just means deception part means perception. Intero means interior. So you want to allow your your in child, your adolescent, to develop interoception. How do you do that? You literally ask them, at a minimum, to be in touch with what their body is telling them. What is your heart telling you right now? Not not in a moment of fighting with them about, you know, you're not going to the party, how does your heart feel? No, you're in a fight. But in general, you raise your child and adolescent to say, I want you to check in with your heart. I want you to check in with your intestines. Check in with your body. What are your muscles telling you? What is your face telling you? So that's the body part of it. I use a term called mindsight, which interoception is a part of that, which means you expand beyond just the body to say, this is the, another acronym, SIFT. Okay, those are the sensations in your body. What images do you have in your mind's eye? That's the I. What feelings do you have? That's the F. What T, what thoughts do you have? So you ask them literally to sift the mind, including the interoceptive sensations. And in doing that over time, literally, you're going to increase the growth of a, a region of the brain called the insula, and you're going to increase the way the insula is communicating with prefrontal areas that can reason and ultimately be in charge of regulating emotion and thought and behavior. And so what you're doing literally in the internal compass is you're building this internal set of circuits so that when your child has that car that could go 100 miles an hour, literally you've increased the pathway from heartfelt sensations and gut sensations up into the insula and then to the prefrontal cortex. And the child, now adolescent, will say, this feels wrong. I'm not just saying no to the 100 mile an hour drive because of what my mommy said or the policeman's going to arrest me because those are adults and I'm going to push against that. But I'm saying from my own heart and my own gut, this is wrong. And I feel strong about saying no. I am not driving that car 100 miles an hour, even if my friends are goading me to do it. That's the kind of internal compass we want to develop. In our I, I, I think that's a really, really useful tool and, and one that uh, will we'll apply with our, with our younger one and, and, our, and our other boys because it, that uh, mind sight seems to be a, a real key. Now, as we get to um, this uh, fourth uh, component, of um, the uh, idea of the essential aspects of adolescence, the CE. Um, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, we have emotional spark, social engagement, and novelty seeking. Those are the first three. The one is CE is creative exploration. And here what you see across all cultures that have been studied is that adolescents push against the adult status quo. It can be subtle. So in some cultures, you know, where there's a lot of weaving, the adults say weave from the bottom to the top. Well, the adolescent says, hey, 
enough of this bottom to top stuff. I'm going to weave from the top to the bottom. Or other people, of course, say, hey, you know, you've delivered a world like this to me. I'm going to create a whole new new world. Let's talk about social media. Um, innovations happen in the world because of adolescent minds primarily in art, in music, in science, in technology. And the reason for this is because if you think about it as an individual, if you're just accepting what adults are giving you, why would you ever leave the home? You just stay there and say, hey, this is pretty comfortable. I think I'll just stay here. And there's biological reasons why that's not such a good thing. Now, for the species, I think the reason this creative exploration is pushing against adult status quo is there is because the world is forever changing. But if you're an adult listening to this, and Alex, for you and I to think about this, you know, when we go through adolescence, we go from being a generalist as a kid to beginning to specialize what our interests are as an adolescent. And then as an adult, we find a niche in society where we do this or we do that. No one is expecting you as an adult to like everything or be good at everything like they do an elementary school kid. It's amazing, but this is kind of the transition from being a generalist to a specialist. Now, once we've found our niche and you're working hard and if you want, you set up a family and you come home at night and you're, you're really, what, you're tired and you want to just sit back and read a book or watch TV or just hang loose and go to sleep. So you've found your adaptation to the world, but the world is forever changing. If nature didn't make adolescents different from adults, we would not be as adaptive as a species as we are because the world is forever changing. Adults have already adapted to a world that's already different, and now they've settled in. They're exhausted. You know, Adolescents have got the energy, the emotional spark. They've got the collaboration, the social engagement. They've got the courage, the novelty seeking, and now they've got the imagination to think about a world that could be rather than just learning about the world that is what adults have handed them, which is what we learn in childhood. So creative exploration is really the gateway to imagination and innovation. So in doing that, the downside, what's you say, well, that sounds all good. Was there a downside to it? Yeah, there is a downside. You know, I remember for myself, when I first became an adolescent, started feeling like, wow, my parents don't really know as much as I thought they did. In fact, I used to think of them as gods and goddesses and, you know, and I go, oh my God, what happened to them? You know, or then I look at the They're really human, right? You remember that? Right. They're really human. It's a fall from grace. And of course, as parents, it feels bad when our little kid doesn't look at us that way. And it's a big change, you know, not only are they going to their peers instead of their parents, so we feel rejected, You know, and their emotional spark gets us confused, maybe for some of us even envious that we miss that passion in our life. But this creative exploration, and on top of that, the novelty seeking with this risky stuff, it can drive us mad as parents. But here's the the thing. You know, nature needs both the individual and the species to have this creative exploration. And so what we want to do is support that kind of innovation. And, you know, in the changes we're trying to create in schools to build schools on this essence business of, you know, that's described in Brainstorm, you know, we're really trying to, to optimize how this disappointment that adolescents feel in us, uh, in us as adults and us as society, can be turned from disillusionment and despair and discouragement, disappointment, all the disses, you know, there's a lot of disses that you can feel in adolescence, turn that into energy to drive innovation, you know? So you say, yes, we adapted to a world that doesn't even exist anymore. And you are ready to take on the world and you are the hope for the future is what I say when I talk to adolescents themselves. And this is, you know, this is why this has got to be a change in the cultural conversation about adolescence. It really, really does. Well, I, I agree. And I, you know, I, you know, I'm thinking back and I'm, you know, I'm stepping back through kind of generational trends that relate to creative expression and what a interesting time we are in with millennials. You know, we, Mm -hmm. we, we have adolescents that have founded multi-billion dollar companies 
And exactly. We're seeing, there you go. Well, that's it. This ult- ultimate expression of the the CE in in essence that are transforming our world. And, totally. You know, you know that, and that's the amazing thing. People look at it in, in dismay, but you know when you really think of it from uh, an uh, evolutionary point of view, you know, especially looking at the essence, it's a wonderful thing. You know, and and this is where you know some of the different meetings that we go to, like this meeting called Wisdom 2.0. You know, a lot of these are the adolescents now grown into young adults, and we want to encourage them to use their newfound power, literally the ability to influence people as a way of defining power to use that power to influence the world in a positive way, not just about money, but actually try to transform the world to encourage you know, internal compass development, to, to encourage mindset, basically, to encourage wisdom, to encourage kindness and compassion. You know, and so what's been beautiful about it is um, you know, to try to collaborate across the generational divide. I mean, and this is, it's possible. Well, and it, it seems that there's this heightened, heightened level of social consciousness um, that that our young people have that uh, it is very different than you know my generation had. I, mine too, you know, and it's a, it's a really really exciting thing, you know. I, you know, you just read the news and you can only feel the heaviness of it. And I I feel for adolescents now, you know, teenagers and you know adolescents goes into the mid to late twenties. So, you know, adapting to this world and seeing what the world really is with open eyes, you know. Adolescents really are our hope for the future to really think in creative new ways to to find a way to, to including you know what I say at the end of the book is you know um, we've lived in a world where there's been a belief that the mind and the self that's created from the mind is just inside your body. Some people would say it's inside your brain, you know where you're just a separate solo act, and that's just destroying. Health, it's destroying happiness, it's destroying even the planet in many ways. We need to realize we are all interconnected with each other, and our identity, our sense of self, is both an internal one, which is very important, like an internal compass, but it's also a collective one. So I I say it's not only a me, and it's not only just a we, it's a combination of the two. And so I end the book saying, you know, it's a we, M W E, would be an integrated identity, and together we can make this a better world, you know. And that's that's the kind of message I think we've got to give. And using the power and purpose of these changes, um, I think there's a huge potential. And it's why, you know, this is, you know, this whole approach is not only helpful for families, you know, so parents understand their adolescent in a different way. An adolescent can be understood and understand themselves in a different way. But on top of that, I really believe deeply that the challenges the world is facing now are are going to be best dealt with by adolescent minds. And instead of just marginalizing them or making them, you know, fall into this view that raging hormones are making them act mad or all these things, there is so much potential in the individual adolescent and in adolescents collectively that we can tap into. I'm incredibly excited about what we can do as a culture to really support their movement into the world. Yeah. I, I I think these are these are exciting times and you know so often we're we're focused on some of the negative effects of technology and I I look at it a little bit differently and you know modern technology has has some downsides some of our you know kids have forgotten to play and live in the analog world you know they're they're so in tuned with the digital world but it's interesting because we now have a different sense of community uh it's not just this immediate community that that I see with my eyes in my physical space it's the community that I now see globally through the internet and I I think that our kids are thinking in different ways because their perspective is so different because it's so wide it's so wide it's so interconnected and and you know it's going to be challenging you know we have a lot of challenges as a human family and we need to use this wide <laughs> interconnected world we're now living in uh, to optimize uh, how life can be for the, our human family. And this is, you know, the good news is, I mean, I, you know, I know I was born on Hope Street and I have B positive blood, <laughs> so I'm very optimistic, you know. Um, but I, I do believe very deeply that um, 
we're at a turning point in in uh, modern culture where people can feel this sense of collective uh, collaboration to try to cultivate a much better world than we've had in our isolated ways. And I know it's positive thinking, uh, but I really believe that the way to tap into at least the possibility of that happening uh, is by really looking at these positive aspects, especially of adolescence. You know, there there's such a rich potential there. You know, at it, it, it risk of of breaking this this kind of positive high I'm I, I'm feeling about uh, th- this discussion, there's there are really negative things also happening. You know, just yesterday uh, in in our community uh, here in northern Utah, a local high school student stole a gun from a family member, loaded, brought it to school with the intention to shoot his ex girlfriend and other students. Um, Fortunately, a student happened to see that gun, reported it, and uh, I, I believe many lives were were saved yesterday mm-hmm. by that student's quick quick thinking. But you know, we're we're seeing as a nation this disturbing increase uh, in in violence, and you know, I'm wondering, do you have any insight on what's driving young people to such extreme behaviors that I never remember anything like that when mm-hmm. I was a kid? You know, if, mm-hmm. uh, if, if somebody brought a knife to my high school, I would have been absolutely shocked. Absolutely. And, and the evening news, too frequently, you know, we're having these devastating events. What's going on? You know, I I, I don't know what's going on. Is the the simplest thing to say. I mean, I have ideas that uh, might have elements of truth, and you know, I know different people have different opinions. So I can say a few of them. I mean, but these are just speculations. Uh, first sure. of all, it's so sad that it's happening, but it is happening in ways that are are really uh, terrifying. I think, on a number of levels, uh, there is more focus on the outside world than ever before. I I can walk to a school and I'll watch a young father, a young mother with, let's say, a one-year-old in their arms, and they're on their smartphones, uh, not interacting with the baby at all. Um, I'll see people at restaurants, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 50-year-olds even. They're all on their smartphones, uh, just not interacting with each other. Uh, I think there's become an incredible focus um, let's just, and not video games per se, but just on screens where your life has become focusing your eyes on screens. Um, and there's not much look at the internal world. So if we begin there with this incredible shift in how much data is being streamed about the external world into our brains, um, there's a, a um, excessive dominance of external focus. That's number one. Number two is you have this sense of then not being connected to other people. And since we are very social beings, that sense of disconnection can be very, very uh, painful and isolating. And when you finally uh, get some sense that the world is responding to you for some people, it actually can come from some of these video games where you get points, for example, for shooting somebody. And I'm not, I'm not blaming a video game. What I'm saying is that, ironically, one source of feeling like you're alive is when you get points for doing a destructive act. Right. You know, now, sadly, a third thing is, and this is not in all communities, because in some communities there's no attention paid to it, but in other communities you see a lot of attention paid when a violent act is committed, like in Newtown or something like that. And, you know, if you are feeling empty inside, disconnected from your peers or your parents, um, feeling um, like there's no hope, maybe you have a psychiatric disorder, maybe you don't, because some people might have it and some people may not, where you're, for example, having psychotic thinking, because that's, you know, more than 1% of the population has a disorder of disordered thinking, you know, where you, you're not thinking straight. Um, and so that can be present there. But even short of that, all these, these cultural factors can play so that you you actually feel so empty when you hear the, the attention that's paid. You feel like at least if I kill someone, 
I won't be invisible. And I know that sounds bizarre, but from a deep existential issue, invisibility is, in a sense, worse than death. So you can do something about your invisibility, you think. Now, the the problem with all that thinking, of course, is that it doesn't get you what you want, number one. All these people will be hurt, number two. There is another solution that is finding connection and meaning in your life. And even if you have a, a psychiatric disorder of a psychotic sort, there's all sorts of really effective treatments. So isolation never needs to lead to murder or suicide because uh, there, there are other choices that can lead to a much better outcome, no matter what the person's thoughts are or fantasies are that's driving them in that direction. So those are just some of the factors, and I'm sure there are other factors. Alex, I don't know if you have ones you're thinking of, but those are just some that I've thought of. That no, it, it, it's, con- it's consistent with, you know, with what I what I'm feeling and, you know, I think these common images of, of violence in the media that you tend to see a, a a trend when something has been heavily publicized, we we see the quote unquote copycat um act, acts of violence uh, you know taking place and you know, mm-hmm. they're just images that are that our children see and messages that they hear that just weren't part of society before. Yeah, exactly. And it's this, exactly. It's this new, new world. So I, I think there's no question, you know, that technology has benefits, and on on other hands, the you know the media uh, ups their ratings with viewership, and nothing gets views more than violence. Well, this is the this is the sad truth, and you know, I mean, this is just, and I mean, obviously we need to add, but this is obviously a very controversial issue: the accessibility of firearms. Yeah. You know, automatic weapons, especially. You know, you, you you make that available, and of course, everyone's going to argue. Well, they'll become available even if they're illegal. So, I, mean, I appreciate it's a very complicated issue, um, but we need to work, I think, at the root of the problem, which isn't always what's straight in front of you. You know, which is, you know, how can we actually find a way of realizing we are all interdependent, so that someone who's becoming isolated. Uh, can have a community around them, and the community becomes the support system. Uh, and the the concern of all these comments are, you know, that you know we are losing a sense of belonging to a community, and in that isolation, all sorts of desperate acts can emerge. Sure. Maybe in in closing this this particular topic, you know, for parents, uh, teachers, therapists that are you know listening now. What do you see as some signs um, that they could look for to identify that a child might be at risk uh, for for some of these dangerous behaviors? Well, you know, there's a whole um, clinical approach to that and science of that that I'm not uh, an expert in terms of really um, looking for the signs that someone could, uh, you know, do a, uh, a huge act of violence, let's say, at a school or something like that. So I'm, I'm not the person to call on sure. that. If you're, if you're talking about in general about um, when does uh, an adolescent's behavior put up a red flag just broadly that something's not going right? Well, the well way- sure. You know, when, when, when do we need to intervene? Right. And get so the out. way the way I think about it is it's kind of a, a building on things I talk about in a book called Mindsight, which is basically that a healthy mind um, creates harmony both within the individual and between the individual and others. Now, the adolescent period of remodeling, which includes this change in the brain by way of pruning of the brain and then laying that, which is removal of certain. Um, uh, connections among the basic cells of the brain, the neuron, um, so that you're actually specializing the brain through pruning. And then you lay down myelin, which makes the remaining circuits more coordinated and even faster and efficient in how they communicate with each other. So that's a linkage. So basically, the pruning process is leading to a an increase in specialization in the brain and an increase in the linkage in the brain. And when you link differentiated areas like that, it's called integration. So this period of pruning and myelination can have times of not harmony where there's chaos going on or rigidity. Those are the two signs 
that uh, an individual or the system the individual is in is not what's called integrated, which I think is the basis of health. So the broadest thing to say is look for chaos. Things are out of control, emotions out of control, not just intense and and labile, that is where they're coming and going, but it really prolonged low road behaviors, prolonged meltdowns where things are chaotic or rigid. R- rigidity would be the kind of withdrawal you're talking about. Right. So extensive chaos or extensive rigidity are the two big areas you want to watch for. So if a person is becoming depressed, for example, they may isolate themselves and withdraw. If a person is becoming filled with obsessive compulsive disorder, they may become filled with the chaotic intrusions that there's danger, 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 and then carry out these kind of repetitive, rigid acts. So even in a given individual, you can see chaos and rigidity. In an adolescent, what you want to realize is that because of the pruning and myelination, it's like a house that's undergoing remodeling, it's not immature, it's just in a state of reconstruction. So when you go into a beautiful mansion that was your child, that's now being remodeled. You don't say, oh, this mansion being remodeled is immature. You say, you know, sometimes the plumbing is not going to work ideally. You're redoing the electricity. <laughs> you know, there's different things. So we want to give space it's for that. It's under construction. I love it. It's, yeah, it's a reconstructive process. So you say, okay, if there's prolonged lack of communication, because the, the secret, and I talk for the adults reading the book, you know, I say the secret is be present for your adolescent. And I give all sorts of examples of how to do that through all sorts of the challenges. And then what you want to do is leave the lines of communication open. You'll get a feeling in your gut when there's something really not right. And then the first thing to do, of course, in a loving way, not during a meltdown, but at other times, just start talking about what what you're concerned about, not only with your partner or a professional, but with your own child, with your adolescent. Um, and so they can say, look, mom, I'm doing fine. I'm actually happy. But, you know, there's some kids at school that just aren't being nice to me, and it really bums me out. And they may say things like that and then give space to have a conversation about that. Oh, I, I, I think that's beautiful. So I've got a personal question for you. Yeah. Knowing what you know now about the teenage brain, if you could have a do-over in raising your kids, would you do anything differently? Wow. Wow. Well, that's a really, really interesting question. I think I would relax a lot more (laughs) than I was. Uh, That'd be one thing. Um, I think I would, uh, you know, we always were trying to teach them mindset stuff from the time they were little. So that part would be there uh, anyway. But I guess I would relax a little more and I wouldn't have taken the pushback on me so personally and um, you know, I had a very different kind of adolescent for various reasons in my own family. So I think I was sort of learning for the first time with them, what, you know, what a regular adolescence would be like. Yeah. Um, and I think I would just tell myself to relax. And I think that would have made their adolescence a little bit better. I think uh, I, I, I think that's sage advice, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna, get... I'll get on a time machine and try to do that. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I think as parting words for parents, um, you know, if if you were to say, and I think it goes there, you know, what what's the number one recommendation uh, that you might make? I'll I'll take a leap and and it is listen and relax. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, listen and relax. Be present for your adolescent. You know, it's it's something we can all develop, and you know, it's good for adolescent and it's good for us too. The thing that I'm blown away, and this is the other thing I'll just say in terms of a a recommendation, is adolescents can become our teachers. You know, this essence of adolescence is exactly what we as adults need to hold on to because if you said, how do I keep my brain growing well and being young and vital as an adult, it'd be these four things, emotional spark, social engagement, novelty, and creative exploration. And sadly, many adults have lost several, if not all, of those features in their life. So adolescents have a lot to remind us about and even teach us. Uh, certainly. And, uh, and, uh, and speaking of which, uh, for the teens that are joining us this evening, do you have any parting words for them? Yeah. You know, the great news, what we know from science now, is you as an adolescent have this opportunity to learn about your brain, to learn about your relationships with other people, adults and other adolescents, and to actually be empowered to optimize your life. 
And these changes that we didn't know you could actually create, for example, and how your brain gets integrated are fantastic. They are, uh, they are strengthening of your brain that will last a lifetime for you. So this is an incredible time to learn about your brain, how to integrate your life. And I'm so excited to see how adolescence will go and how you collectively can come into this world and really help us find the kind of changes we need to make this a better world to live in. Um, beautiful. Beautiful uh, closing words. Thank you so much, Daniel. A pleasure. Um, Thank you, Alex. You know, for everyone listening, I really hope tonight's program was helpful to you in some way. You know, I, I certainly, uh, as a parent, have a lot of food for thought. Um, I would encourage you, uh, Dr. Siegel has so many events, offerings, books, DVDs, and resources. Uh, please visit his website, which is drdansiegel.com. That's D R D A N S I E G E L dot com. And if you'd like more information on the listening program and the work that we're doing here at Advanced Brain Technologies, you can visit us at advancedbrain.com or just give us a phone call, uh, area code 801 622 5676. Uh, you can access a recording of tonight's program on our website uh, late tomorrow, and you can also subscribe to the Listening Program Radio podcast on iTunes to hear this and, and other shows, and we certainly hope uh, you'll share this great information that uh, Dr. Siegel has shared with us this evening uh, with, with others. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening, and once again, uh, thank you to Daniel for joining us, and uh, I hope everyone's well and you have safe and happy holidays with your family and loved ones. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Brain Podcast with best-selling author, keynote speaker, and founder of Advanced Brain Technologies, Alex Doman. In the show notes, you can find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it's free to subscribe, and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, you'll find it right there waiting for you to listen to in your podcast app of choice. And for more information regarding the world's most innovative neuroscience-based music programs for optimal human performance, please visit advancedbrain.com.